Welcome back, everybody. It's This Week in Startups, and it's our Startup Basics series. What is Startup Basics? Well, I could ask a lot of questions over and over and over and over and over again. And it's exhausting because I have to repeat the same answer. And let's face it, I have an expertise in startups and investing in them, but there are people in specific verticals like legal or finance recruiting, you know, you get the idea, who have a much deeper and more updated set of knowledge that I don't have. And so we do these Startup basic series every couple of years. We refresh them. We talk to some experts in our circle, the people who we work with, and uh, we do this in partnership with them to try to have files and videos and podcasts where we can point people to this and say, watch this for 20 minutes, watch this for 30 minutes, and then let us know what questions you have. What specific questions do you have after that? And then once we have those, startups tend to avoid major, costly, unnecessary, self-inflicted wounds, which I can tell you in legal and finance can be very acute and they are very avoidable. So Scott Orn is with us again uh, to do our finance basics, right? And you may have seen the first episode where we did basically acing your due diligence, super important. And then we did a, in the second episode of Startup Finance Basics, we did a deep dive onto taxes, super important. Always get your taxes right. Always have your diligence right. And today, Scott and I, and Scott's with Cruise Consulting, uh, and you can go to cruise, K-R-U-Z-E, consulting.com slash twist to see all of their content. And they've got 20 minute videos on things we'll spend one minute on here, right, when we're giving our overview. So you can really do some deep dives over at cruiseconsulting.com slash twist. But today, Scott, we're going to do the five things you need to nail in order to scale. It rhymes and it's important, right? I love it. I love it. And this, I feel just like you, where I say the same stuff over and over a lot of times. So I'm super excited to have this recorded on video with you so that you and I can uh, do other things, but people can still get the benefit of all our knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. So all of this um, knowledge is again on their website. And in the show notes, you will find all these bullet points and links to places to go to get more information. The first one I would say, well, just a quick overview. You're going to need after you take money from someone like Jason, you're going to need to start producing financial statements. And so you're going to need to start actually having reporting. And with financial statements comes the necessity of also having other systems that we'll talk about here in a second. But I think just quickly, the, th the three statements you're going to need to start producing for your financials are an income statement, a balance sheet, and a cash flow statement. And you know you can do that on yourself or you can work with an accounting firm, someone like us or someone else but you're going to need those three statements. The income statement is probably, I don't want to say one's more important than the other, but the income statement is going to show what you're bringing in revenue and what your expenses and give you kind of a simple burn rate. But of course, all investors and, and startup founders know that cash is king. And that's really what's reflected on your balance sheet, along mm. with all the kind of liabilities you have and things like that. And then third, especially for capital intensive businesses, which are, you know, equipment companies, robot companies, biotech, medtech, you are going to want to pay attention to your cash flow statement because you may be investing in big ticket things that don't really show up on your income statement because they're expensed over time, but they do that big cash outflow does show up on your cash flow statement. So those are the big three. So I just want to kind of orient everyone towards that. And then I think it's helpful probably if you're okay with it, Jason, just talking about some of the systems that people sh should set up once they get going. Yeah. Well, the first one is I, I see here is super obvious. Having a fresh, clean bank account as opposed to something that has some legacy, you know, deposits, some money you put in from your previous startup, the wrong tax ID, all this nonsense. You want to start fresh. <laughs> clean and have that when you log in it's only this project correct i, I That's can't a no I'm, I'm laughing because i talked to two separate twist listeners last week who had kind of by the way nicest people in the world so uh, so yeah. you know Good just want to get Good things fans. fixed but they made this mistake and yes. untangle they, i think they could kind of see on the zoom call with them like my face cringing a little bit because it's yeah. actually hard to unwind this a little bit. So the first thing, like when you, when Jason sends you a term sheet and you sign it and you're about to get a wire from, you know, launch, you definitely want to go to Silicon Valley Bank or First Republic, Mercury wrote a bank that is, you know, that works with startups, that's used to working with startups and set up a fresh account. That money should come in there. 
Do not let it hit your personal bank account. Ooh. Do not pay personal things out of the company bank account. Keep them separate. It'll save you so much time and energy and fees for your accounting firm to unwind that stuff. And it's good hygiene. So I always uh, would make this mistake. I'd be carrying two credit cards with me, or I'd, I would forget my corporate card. Then I put business stuff on my personal card. Or my personal card, everybody's had this experience. Your personal card gets declined. You're in an airport. You use your business card for a personal expense. And then you got to go switch that, take it out. And now, oh my Lord, somebody looks at it and it can be weaponized against you. It could be problematic and just make you look dumb that like, oh my God, you put your business class, you know, or your, you, you bought your vacation airplane tickets by mistake because you had it in your, you know, password or credit card, uh, you know, Chrome extension to just auto pay, right? So you got to be careful with that stuff because it looks bad. It's bad optics. Totally. And, you know, the, the thing, like you talked about being weaponized against you. The first, we've had a bunch of, we do taxes. So we have a bunch of companies get audited. The f Literally the first thing the IRS asks for when they audit you is all money transactions going back and forth between the founder and the company. And that's wow. because that's the I easiest that. way to avoid payroll taxes. For, oh, totally. That's the first thing. Wow. And so, you know, if you keep so they it know. separate. They're like detectives. They're like master detectives. They know exactly the, follow the money. Follow them. Totally. And, and it's a, it's a great way to, it's also prevents theft. You do not want to have a culture of your, at your company of mixing things mm. because sometimes we'll come in at like a series A or series B company. And this doesn't happen all the time. It's not super often, but like maybe once a year, we'll find the office manager was paying their personal credit card with the company's money because Oof. there weren't, you know, actual checks and balances and a culture of accountability and separation set up. And so that's theft. And there's nothing more embarrassing than reporting that to your board. We even had a, what, a, a, a CEO who we loved, who this is probably four years ago. We love this guy. He's the nicest guy in, in the world. He kind of like, he just kind of made this lapse in judgment where he thought of the company's money, even though it's from investors as his own money. And so he spent about $10,000 of the company's money on clothes and dinners and things Oof. like that. And we found it and we had to do like a kind of a delicate conversation with the board and say like yep. hey this is this is not and you know what he ended up uh removing himself from the company he was it, it cost him a lot so just over please 10k in, don't do this kind of stuff yeah. it's so dumb because what happens in these situations is people are like well i'm being underpaid so i put some expenses there and it's like no no just negotiate your salary directly with the board and increase your salary so if you feel underpaid then the proper way to do that is go to your board and say i need to get 2k more a month in order to stay solvent or because i deserve it or whatever the reason is or no reason at all rather than taking a third of your apartment and you know, reimbursing yourself $20,000 at the end of the year for it or something silly like that. Okay, let's go on to number two. And I used to have this problem all the time, which is when I was young, maybe I couldn't get a credit card. I didn't have great, um, I didn't have great uh, credit when I was in my 20s. Let's leave it at that. And I was concerned about putting a personal guarantee on the corporate card. What if the company has a problem and I got $20,000 in the card that month? Am I going to be wiped out personally? So let's talk about credit cards with no personal guarantee. These are possible today, correct? Absolutely. Brex actually changed the market. The reason why Brex has such a big valuation is they figured this out. So prior, you know, SVB, Amex, Chase, whoever you're using, you had to either do a personal guarantee, which your credit's on the line, or you would have to segment a bunch of cash in your bank account, put it into a different bank account that they could, you know, pull if your credit card got overdrawn or you didn't pay it back. Brex came to market and said like, hey, there's a better way. Let's do audit debits and just underwrite kind of proactively on this. And I, Jason, I, I, I'm sure you've heard some horror stories, but I, I'll never forget, like I was on vacation. We had a company that wasn't going to make it. And I was helping do the kind of the wind down and they had a senior lender and the senior lender was about to sweep all the cash and it was all fine. It was all agreed upon and everything. And I just happened to kind of ask the founder, Hey, did you pay your credit cards off? Cause mm. I remember they had Amex and she was like, Oh my God, we haven't yet. And it was turned out to be Ooh. a $25,000 balance. <gasps> That she would have. So imagine your startup's going down. You've made nothing for very little for two years. And then all of a sudden you're going to owe another $25,000. Oh, so wow. she paid it, but it was, it was like, it was just like absent mindedly. I kind of asked that question. So when Brex came in the market, we really kind of put an emphasis on that. Now, the cool thing is SVB and, and Amex both have uh, startup focus offerings now. So they are now. So they uh, react to Brex being in the market. Totally. It was capitalism. Yeah. Capitalism. Yeah, I love best, it. Right. Competition. Yeah. The next one I get a ton of questions about, which is what 
accounting software should I use? And there's a lot of new entrants. There's a lot of people trying to get your business. But I have always done QuickBooks. And in the old days, we would have to buy DVDs and have multiple licenses for $600 <laughs> a year. It was very frustrating. But now it's all online. I remember that happening 10 or 15 years ago. It all moved online. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the standard, right? Absolutely. QuickBooks Online, they, they success, they're one of the few companies that successfully ported from desktop to the cloud. It's That's really difficult to do. When Adobe did it too, right? They did Adobe really did a great job too. Zero is the kind of alternative. They came in the market probably like eight or nine years ago, really scared QuickBooks. So again, capitalism at work here. Right. QuickBooks got on their horse, got QuickBooks Online. And now visualize like kind of the sun in the solar system. QuickBooks is the center of the sun. And there's tons of apps that now are plugging in and integrating the QuickBooks. And it's it's really important. We've had companies use Zero in the past and not not to be, I don't wanna be smirch anyone, but like I'm never sitting there with Vanessa and I going over our tax return because Vanessa's our head of tax and she does all the tax returns. And we were hitting refresh on Zero, and there was a $100,000 deposit that was moving between Ooh. December and January. It was terrifying. Ugh. And that deposit swung the company into a loss or gain, depending <laughs> on what, it was like happening in real time. And so we, we did the conservative thing. We filed it as the gain in December. That company paid the taxes. That company ended up getting audited. They passed their audit, but that was the moment where we swore that we were going to be a QuickBooks online shop only because yeah. you just can't mess around with this kind of stuff. And so that's yeah. why I mean, we're and listen, on QuickBooks. It's 26 bucks a month, 35 bucks a month. This stuff is so cheap. Well worth it. Do it right. So now I got my perfect bank account fresh and clean. I got my credit card fresh and clean. It's sweeping. Uh, it's not, I got a personal guarantee and I got QuickBooks all set up. Now, clean, clean, clean. Everything's fresh. No problems. All standardized on the top so software and platforms and providers. But this is the one where I think people get bombarded with choices, which is payroll. You got to get your payroll taxes right. There's a bunch of people, Zenefits, Gusto, Rippling. We've had many of them as uh, partners on this podcast uh, and advertising. We've used all of them. In fact, we I think we use two of them right now. Tell me, what is the standard? Does it matter if you use Gusto, Rippling? Or they're all in great competition with each other, providing yeah. great services, correct? They all have, and I would, I would throw Trina in there and JustWorks Trina, as well. Sure. And it, but those four, the big four, you're not going to really go wrong. They all have their strengths. Gusto, I'll still never forget, Vanessa came home about eight or nine years ago. She had just met Josh and the rest of the team at Zen Payroll, which became Gusto. They were right. a four-person company. And she said, A, I should invest in them, which I was too stupid to listen to. And B, <laughs> she's like, they're Story we're going to put payroll in the cloud and automate it. And it was such a game changer for her because instead of charging all her clients an hour to run payroll, it was now being done automatically. Huge game changer. Now, Rippling, Trinet, you know, JustWorks all have that functionality. But I think the, the, the big kind of dichotomy now is whether you go PEO or whether you just run kind of the normal payroll and benefits stack. So Gusto does normal payroll benefits. Rippling does normal payroll benefits, but they've come out with a PEO. And then Trinet and JustWorks are PEO. And the advantage, what's really kind of happened since COVID hit is PEOs have become more popular because a lot of team members have kind of, for lack of a better word, fled San Francisco yeah, and New York. You don't even know where they are. Yeah, they're all over. I can tell you, we see all the state registrations and we see a lot of the state tax stuff. And so the PEOs are actually helpful in that they will handle some of the local tax compliance yes. for you, which is really, really nice. It's super important. Yeah. And for people who don't know, a PEO is a personal employer organization. When you have a PEO, you basically have your employee, your all of your team members become employees of the PEO. The PEO is a collection of companies, almost like a a mutual fund of employees of all these different companies, which means they can qualify for great benefits and get them, you know, benefits based on 10,000 people, even if it's just, uh, you know, 100, 100 person companies or, you know, but at some point, you will come off of a PEO. And I think that number is 100 or 200 employees, you'll yeah, eventually right flip ballpark. back to employing them directly, correct? Yep, yep, exactly. And, you know, the nice thing about so that's you're exactly right, that the, the bu collective buying power gets you better deals on the PEO. One of the things we like about Rippling, they have a, they have a lot kind of they're more they're fresher company, but kind of more modern tech stack. Sure. But they also let you work with independent brokers. So like Cruise, we are in like 15, 20 states. We actually use Rippling and we're able to use independent broker who got us some of that savings. We saved about thirty thousand dollars 
last year just by working through an independent broker. So there's a reason why those independent brokers are out there and they're still they're still doing well. So that's really helpful. And then of course, a lot of early, super early stage companies do start with Gusto. It's a great place to start, very easy, intuitive, and they put a lot of effort into their customer support. So you really can't go wrong with those four. But mm-hmm. if I can just make one point, I yeah. talked to a, another Twist listener uh, on Monday and he had done the cardinal sin of, he it was, he was it was tight he was you know his personal finances were mixed in and he had done fifty thousand dollars of distributions to himself without Oof. running it through payroll. We talked about this on the tax episode. You know the IRS uh, and all kinds of regional authorities. When you pay yourself a distribution, they're going to say, "Where's the pay- is that payroll? Did you work for that? Is that a distribution? What tax event?" can we (laughs) now do and you need to be careful do not do this draw thing i mean if you do it for three months you might be able to clean it up but it's just not worth it you want to do these things right correct scott because when you do them wrong it's a red flag and then the diligence team at whatever venture firm or seed fund or accelerator goes okay what else is wrong if they got these three things wrong they're using their you're, you, they're putting, they're mixing personal and professional. They're paying themselves draws. They're not paying taxes. They didn't file. They're not using, you know, proper software. They're doing this in a Google sheet for accounting. Like y- you're just going to get yourself in trouble. And all of this work, if we look at it, is so easy now. You're, setting this up is low hundreds of dollars, maybe in total. Yeah, absolutely. And the beautiful thing about this is that all scales beyond even 100 employees. Like you're mm-hmm. not going to have to touch anything for a really long time. And like years. Especially like when you're getting that those first checks and setting this stuff up, you ha- do have a little bit of breathing room right in that moment. Mm. You're going to get so busy that it's going to be like this I call it like accounting debt, the same way you have technical debt. Like yep. you're not going to want to address this stuff. It's a pain in the butt. And so just setting up correctly the first time makes it so much easier. All right. Now, tax compliance. This is critically important. So we got through the first five items. Pretty, pretty easy. Get a clean bank account. Get a great credit card with no personal guarantee. Get the right online accounting software. Set up your payroll properly, either PEO or with one of these firms. All of this is going to be a couple of hours each. I would I'd put each of these items at two hours for you to master it. So you're looking at one one day of work. In the old days, this might be two or three days of work each. Getting the software, totally. getting a computer, installing QuickBooks, you know, going to the bank, s- filling out a bunch of forms and having to go to the branch and all this nonsense. But the last one, tax compliance. Okay. Tell us about tax compliance. Here. And and we've gone over this topic, so I'll do it quickly, but yeah. you're going to need to do your Delaware franchise tax. You're going to need to do 1099s, which we just completed yesterday. It's the first Mm -hmm. thing that comes in the year. All your contractors who got paid $600 or more are going to need that. If you're in California, New York, Massachusetts, you're going to have like a franchise tax. And then you've got to do a federal and state income tax. And you want to do an R&D tax credit. We had a twist listener. 100%. Yeah, who missed out on the R&D tax credit last year, which is our average is like $50,000 that you just Crazy. miss out on like it's like it's money that goes in your bank account and helps you helps you mitigate your burn. Those are the big ones. Um okay. but I think the the bigger kind of thing uh, this is this is related to tax compliance. We just had a company 2 weeks ago who closed a thir- closed 30 million dollar deal, like a 30 million dollar round. Whew. But 2 days before like hardcore legal and and uh tax diligence we we realized that they had done their tax returns before they came to cruise on a cash basis, Oof, which threw wow. everything out of whack. We had lawyers getting mad at the CEO, getting mad at us. We were getting mad. It was, <laughs> we cleaned it up. We got it done. The round closed. Everything was okay. But it was, there's just like this stress level that you don't need when you're about to no. close a $30 million round. So just making, like making sure all these foundational things are set up and like your accounting is done in accrual from day one and you don't go to like a not good tax firm who's going to do your you tax return right. correctly. I mean, don't yeah, skimp on taxes. It's sort of like, you don't, I always tell people like, if you're going to go for sushi, instead of going three times to a cheap place, go once to the right place. You don't want to skimp on raw fish, get the high quality stuff. Just as a bonus here, we went through the five important items. We now have cap table management software that really educates um, and simplifies 
and really helps the CEO and co-founders understand what their dilution is. What, do you have some recommendations on that? Yeah, the 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 kind of de facto is Carta, which we we've worked with Carta for many many years. We used to do their tax compliance, so we know them very well. There's a new software out there called Pulley, which a lot of companies are using, which is which Pulley. is hot. Uh, yeah, Pulley, and um, I think they just came out of Y Combinator. Um, I think it's P U L L E Y. So there's an alternative to Carta now. You can always, you can also just do the old school spreadsheets for early stage companies. I wouldn't recommend a, a Series A, Series B do that, but that's yep. fine. And there's a couple other options, but getting that in a visual format, making sure your options are granted correctly. I've got two good stories for you. The first one is we had a client again two Fridays ago get a $10 million term sheet, Series A, boom, this is awesome. And guess what? He had not issued all of the stock options yet. Oof. He hadn't signed the term sheet, but he hadn't issued all the stock options yet. And we got a panicked call from him because he had, it was like a riot in the company's offices because people found out about it. All of a sudden, their, their old strike price on their options was going to be two or three times higher because they hadn't been issued yet. And you just really do not want to do that. That's Mute down I the mean, mountain. That's, Be careful. Yeah. Exactly. Got sophisticated employees now, they know that that price matters. Their strike price matters. So get it right. Totally. And then we had another client, this is like six months ago, who was managing all the option grants in his email, which yeah. I would not, <laughs> just totally do not scalable. do that. So instead totally of having scalable. a visual, <laughs> yeah, yeah, t- exactly. Right. And the, the irony is amazing entrepreneur who's built this incredibly scalable transportation technology, but was doing it this way. And we got a hold of it. We cleaned it up for him. But like that, like that's again the stress you do not need, and you're sending a signal to your employees, and they've turned you into an archaeologist. Like you've got to go on the big dig to find out what's going on here. And now you're Indiana Jones trying to uncover, you know, where is the idol? Who's you know? And you could miss stuff. All right, this has been amazing. Yeah, uh, everybody knows the five now. Five things. Just get these right. Clean bank account. Boom. Credit card. Boom. Accounting software, check. Payroll, PEO, do your research. That one does take, you're going to take five meetings there. You want to get comfortable with the right partner. Talk to your startup friends. Talk to your accountant, your attorney. They might have some uh, thoughts on it. Uh, but they generally are similar. Tax compliance, you, you got to just have a great tax attorney because it is a moving ball. Cap table, super simple. You can use a Google Sheet or Excel with your attorneys to start, but you're eventually going to want to put it in a system so people can look it up themselves. And finally, you got to have your projections in order. And this is such a big topic that we're going to talk about it on part four of Startup Finance Basics, budgets, financial models, and managing your cash. Uh, so look for that episode coming up next week. If you're listening to this in real time, or just look in the archive at thisweekinstartups.com. Thank you, Scott. Everybody go to cruiseconsulting.com slash twist, and we'll see you next time on Startup Basics. Startup Basics.